All right. Hey, everyone. Welcome back from that uh, short break. Just uh, want to transition here and uh, move us into the session titled Building Better Online Markets and Communities. We're really excited for this session. Um, we're going to hear from a round of lightning speakers about the work that they and their organizations are doing to build a more trusted, inclusive, efficient internet. And uh, we're really looking forward to that. And then we're going to follow that up with a panel discussion on how we can better enable these efforts to succeed um, now and moving forward. So um, to kick off our round of lightning talks, I would like to ask um, Michelle Fang, uh, Chief Legal Officer of Turo, to uh, join us and tell us about uh, Turo and everything you're doing. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. It's wonderful to be here. I'm Michelle Fang, Chief Legal Officer of Turo. Turo is the world's leading peer-to-peer -peer car sharing company. So think Airbnb for cars. Um, and one of the wonderful things about it and what makes Turo really unique is the access. You know, many people have access to a car and it's a, it's a really, it's a tool for economic empowerment for someone who either may not be able to otherwise afford a car. They can, if, buy one and share it a certain number of days per week and then be able to afford the car they, they may not otherwise be able to or really use it as a tool for economic empowerment and use it to, you know, save for college, help pay off school debt, um, use in retirement, et cetera. It's, it's, you know, a lot easier to buy a car than to buy a home and then uh, make money off of it and um, use it as a tool for, for, for wealth and as an alternative to other forms of employment or in, in addition to that. So um, we're making a really big difference in a lot of people's lives and our, the majority of our hosts come from, um, you know, backgrounds, the immigrant background, minority, military, et cetera. And so we're making a difference in people's lives. So thrilled to be here. Awesome. Thank you so much, Michelle. Uh, great to hear about uh, how Turo is approaching the shaking up the rental car industry. Um, so we'll move next to Sylvia Morse from the Center for Family Life. Hi, everyone. Uh, good morning. Great to be here with you. Um, so I'm Sylvia Morse. I'm uh, Assistant Director in the Cooperative Development Program at Center for Family Life, which is a uh, social services organization in Brooklyn, New York. And for almost 15 years, we've been incubating worker cooperatives or worker owned businesses in um, immigrant communities in New York City, primarily in domestic work sectors. Um, and the project I'll be talking about today is uh, over the past five years, we've been supporting the development of Up and Go, um, which is a platform, a web app for booking home cleaning services in New York City and in the future beyond New York City. Uh, the difference is that it's cooperatively owned by the workers themselves. Um, so the workers set the prices, establish exactly what services they provide, all of the policies, including that affect you know, the safety of their workplace, how to respond to customer disputes, and they own the brand, the IP, they co-design the platform with the engineering team. Um, and so this is really a response to looking at the way we were seeing tech startups uh, enter, um, specifically the home cleaning space, but obviously we've seen um, a lot of different aspects of the digital gig economy changing. Um, and the workers that we serve are primarily monolingual Spanish speakers. Um, some of them have pretty limited formal education. Um, and, you know, some of them don't have basic tech literacy, at least before they started participating in our program and joining the platform. Um, and for many of them, you know, most of the domestic work sector is really informal work and independent workers. And because we had seen over the years of our work, the power of worker cooperatives to um, improve safety and work standards in these sectors by establishing contracts, um, basic tools for people to be able to negotiate for their work, we saw potential to use cooperative models in the digital gig economy space and make sure that these workers could remain competitive in the way that their industry is changing. Mm -hmm. 
Awesome. Thank you, Sylvia, for sharing that. And so we're going to move next to Justin Curtis uh, from the Senior Director of Academic and Strategic Initiatives from the Bryn Mawr School. Go ahead, Justin. Hi. Great. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. Uh, I, like as Dustin said, I'm the uh, Senior Director of Academic and Strategic Initiatives, <clears throat> excuse me, and the Director of Bryn Mawr Online, entering my 19th year at Bryn Mawr. Which the Bryn Mawr School, which is a nonprofit all girls pre K through 12 college preparatory program in Baltimore, Maryland. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about Bryn Mawr on, online today and our kind of journey to this point. I, I'm going to, I remember back in spring break of March 2020 vividly when we realized more than likely that we would not be returning to in person schooling anytime soon. Uh, because of COVID 19, like many schools, we were quickly forced to re envision how to deliver our academic program build community in the online school setting and support our students, faculty, and staff as we navigated this new reality. Over the next few months, we, we learned a tremendous amount about what works in an online environment and equally important, what did not work well. We quickly learned that some of our pedagogical staples of instruction needed to be radically altered to deliver the quality of teaching our students required to continually learn in their online classes. Fortunately, going into this, we had a few things working in our favor. We invested heavily in online platforms and technical training programs several years ago. The technical prowess of our teachers and students helped us to move quickly and focus on pedagogy from the start. Additionally, our faculty are an amazing group of educators. We have a remarkable dedication to their students. We're absolutely committed to delivering the best learning environment possible. And we continue throughout the process uh, of distance learning to invest heavily in professional training for our faculty. And we formed faculty cohorts that develop best practices in several key areas of instruction. So fast forward to today, 16 months later, we've, we've been offering online instruction to our girls in some fashion over the last 16 months without a break. As of next week, our online summer academic classes wrap up. We've seen 400% growth in those classes over the last two years. And based on our experiences and trainings, we feel really confident that we know how to deliver an excellent online experience to our students. And we're always looking to continue to improve our craft. We did, we've learned a lot of things through this and discovered a lot of things through this process. One, there is a demand for online academic programs. It's evident by our online academic coursework. And speaking with parents at many other schools, many families were tired of the online slide and looking for challenging, rigorous online academic environments. Some students truly thrive in an online learning environment for a number of different reasons. Uh, online schools are also flexible, so it'll allow students to pursue their own interests, whether they're athletes, performers, or have another passion. Some students report feeling less anxious in an online environment. So we found that students who are normally, many students who are normally quiet in traditional classroom settings became vocal speakers and participants. Families like the flexibility of not being tied to a geographic location um, we had students taking classes from all over the world. And the online environment really allows us as a school to, to expand our mission and our reach. We, we are dedicated to providing the best academic experience possible for girls. And up until this point, we could only reach girls within a 40-mile radius of the Baltimore, Maryland campus. So we decided to launch Bryn Mawr Alive. And what we're really doing here is we're targeting rising ninth grade girls for our initial cohort. And we're seeking 15 students in year one as we're going through this program. Uh, we're looking for the same traits as we look for our current girls. We're looking for curious, intelligent, inquisitive, and ambitious students to be part of our program. Our academic program mirrors to a T our existing honors and advanced placement program. And we are an accredited in the, in the our diploma award rating school. We offer some of the major uh, programs and services to our kids that we would offer for in-person students. Each person is assigned, each student's assigned a coach for family and student navigation and the online experience. Students are assigned college counselors. Peer mentoring happens between kids on our campus and kids online. And then we offer another, other, another, I'm sorry, a number of other online programs, including a civic engagement series, uh, a partnership with UPenn and social entrepreneurship and MIT on quantum computing. We also plan and will offer shared community opportunities and global experiences with our bricks and mortar online students. And ultimately, what we're really trying to do is we, we aim to establish an, an online Bryn Mawr learning, online Bryn Mawr learning communities across the country and beyond. We, we truly believe that establishing 
an interconnected network of learners benefits all of our students by exposing them to different cultures, viewpoints, and experiences, which help develop our students as global citizens. Thanks for your time, and I appreciate you listening. Awesome. Thank you, Justin. And so we're going to move on to our final lightning talk uh, from Allison Davenport of the Wikimedia Foundation. Yeah, Go ahead, thanks. Allison. Thanks, Dustin. Um, so just this past January, Wikipedia celebrated its 20th birthday, marking 20 years of community efforts to bring free knowledge to the world one added at a time. Uh, we've really used this opportunity to take stock, to celebrate the unique qualities and practices that have brought Wikipedia's community and its projects to their place of relative sophistication today, and to envision how we can continue to improve in the face of an increasingly uncertain future. Uh, on Wikipedia and in the Wikimedia movement, trust has always been an essential component to the past and future success of the projects, whether it was the trust placed in the project's future success by its early editors, or the trust exhibited by its readers who turned to Wikipedia for information on everything from health to human rights. Uh, as we enter an age where trust and in information on online platforms is hard won, we've started to ask ourselves, how can Wikimedia and movements like it continue to thrive and adapt to changes in global social and policy environments that threaten the models that made us trustworthy to begin with? So let's talk a little bit about those models. Wikipedia is built on a strong foundation of technical, social, and normative structures that have shaped both its early success and its longevity. Wikipedia was built with a shared goal in mind to expand access to information through the creation of an online encyclopedia. And everything from the technical structures to the unspoken norms uphold this shared goal. One of the most important aspects of trust in Wikipedia, both for editors and readers, is transparency, which permeates all three of these structures. Technically, transparency is built into every edit on an article, which creates a marker of what was changed and by whom. Discussions about articles occur on public talk pages where they can be noted for posterity. And even the heavy preference for linking to other articles and sources, uh, the impetus for what many call a wiki rabbit hole, uh, is a technical investment in the information contained on Wikipedia continuing to be instantly verifiable. While technical infrastructure is integral to making Wikipedia a trustworthy product, social structures and norms have been central to creating trust within our editor community, which is just as important as our reader community. These structures include elections for administrators who moderate content and behavior, procedures for public discussions about rule changes, even rule changes instigated by the Wikimedia Foundation, and a basic set of content policies and rules that editors can refer to when someone deviates from the project's shared goal. We found that when editors feel a sense of ownership and accountability in the power structures that they have to relate with, they're more likely to trust that those power structures will make the right decision. And finally, over the past 20 years, many additional norms and rules have developed based on need within these longstanding editing communities. These norms are often asking people to assume good faith in the editing process, uh, to welcome newcomers, and to provide safeguards for de-escalating situations where disagreements do occur. Now, as I've sort of reflected on the strengths of Wikipedia over the past 20 years, I also want to look at the obstacles that face us as we turn towards the next 20. Although Wikipedia is available across the globe in 300 different languages, the vast majority of Wikipedia editors still identify as white men. This leads not only to biases in how articles are written, but whether they even get written in the first place. Uh, for example, a recent study showed that one point of the 1.5 million biographies on Wikipedia, less than 19% were about women. Uh, further, new challenges have arisen to our community governance models as more governments propose laws that require greater involvement by platforms and content moderation on their sites, and others seek to just outright censor opposing ideas online. 
proposals attempting to force large social media sites to take responsibility for harmful content often fail to consider what stricter liability on platforms means for community-driven projects like Wikipedia, where most of that content moderation is happening from the community, not the foundation itself. The good news is that in the face of an ever-changing future, Wikimedia and Wikimedians are nothing but adaptable. We saw this when the COVID-19 pandemic hit and the Wikipedia community quickly organized to provide up-to-date information on the pandemic in over 175 different languages. The Wikimedia Foundation has stepped up as well, increasing our support for several direct efforts to expand diversity in the editor community, including direct outreach projects like edit-a-thons that work to both improve the representation gaps on Wikimedia and introduce new editors. We've also undertaken broader improvements to the environment for editors within the movement, including the passing of a universal code of conduct earlier this year that governs interactions both on and off Wiki. And finally, as part of the movement strategy process, the Wikimedia community has identified equity as one of our top two priorities as we look towards 2030. The foundation and the movement recognize the need for evolution right now, and we're excited to address our deep, deepest challenges moving forward. Over the past 20 years, Wikipedia as a project and as a community has grown in a consistent way, and the structures I mentioned earlier are what have encouraged that consistency. Trust from our early editors in the promise of the project created a community, and the project that community created is now trusted to provide information to the world. But as we move forward, we can't take that trust for granted. Instead, we must think about what's holding us back and how we can continue to be adaptable and not boxed in so that we can continue to bring accurate information to the world for the next 20 years. And thank you. Thank you, Allison. Um, and thank you all for the uh, insight into the work that you're doing. Um, so. We'll, we're on schedule to switch over to the panel now. So I'll invite Jerry Mikulski up to moderate that and he will um, introduce the, the panel discussion and bring up the, the lightning speakers as um, later on in the discussion to speak to particular points. So Jerry, go ahead. Sounds great. Thanks, Dustin. Um, it is an honor and a pleasure to be here. Uh, we have some awesome panelists, and I would like to ask them to introduce themselves briefly. We have Matt Dunn, Katie Salen, uh, Corey Doctorow, and Darius Quarles. I, Corey, I think you're winning the Rate My Room today. Um, but if we could go to Matt and just take a, a minute or two just to give us a little context for um, you in this conversation, please. Great, Jerry. Great to great to see you again. Uh, and uh, I am losing the Rate My Room uh, competition. <laughs> Uh, my name is Matt Dunn. Uh, I am uh, beaming in from uh, Heartland, Vermont, uh, where uh, we are reopening the office of the Center on Rural Innovation. Uh, we are an action tank that is focused on closing the rural opportunity gap. Uh, since 2008, uh, a gap has emerged between rural and urban areas driven by automation and globalization and the decline of entrepreneurship. 15% uh, of the nation's workforce lives in rural America, but only 5% of the digital economy jobs. Uh, and it's our, our mission as an organization through uh, training, capacity building, uh, and investment uh, to bring that 5% up to 15% to make sure we have equity and economic mobility uh, across the country, as well as resilience in the face of automation. Awesome. Thanks, Matt. Um, Katie, I'm a I'm an UCI alum, so zot. Oh, zot, zot, zot. <laughs> exactly. Um, and please, the floor is yours. Sure. Um, yeah, I'm really happy to be here with everyone. Uh, my name is Katie Salen. I'm a professor at UCI. So zot is the sound that an anteater makes, apparently. Um, and the anteater is UCI's uh, uh, mascot, which I didn't know before I came here. Um, but I teach in the Department of Informatics. Um, I have a background in games um, as a designer, um, and I've worked in research for a long time. And I also run a, a nonprofit called Connected Camps, which is an online platform where we hire college students to engage with young people um, around interests that they're um, stuff that they're interested in inside of game-based platforms like Minecraft and Roblox. So it's a kind of interest-driven, socially-based learning. 
Um, and we're uh, really keen on looking at this idea of how do you develop kind of healthy and well communities for young people. So I think on the panel today, I'm the kind of representative for kids and children and young people in the world. Um, and I have a my my research looks specifically at online communities, particularly games. Um, and how do we think about governance structures? How do we think about um, developing kind of scaffolded and supportive spaces for young people in those environments? Most kids under 12, lots of kids under 13 are on 13 plus platforms and they watch th streamers who target 13 plus audiences. But basically those spaces are designed by adults for adults um, and they never were conceived as a space where childhood would be spent. Um, and so we're doing a lot of thinking around um, what are the kinds of supports and scaffolds that younger people need when they're in these environments um, that are developmentally appropriate, that allow them, particularly kids in middle childhood or what we call early, early adolescents, to take risks, to experiment, to fail. Um, right now, a lot of the approaches are very punitive and they're very reactionary. And we're trying to kind of shift the conversation to say, if you're really looking for communities of trust and resilience that young people can participate in because they have so much to bring, you have to really attend to what they need um, and not just what adults think, think that they might need. Katie, thank you. Um, so much food for thought and conversation and what you just said. Um, Corey, I, I can't tell you the number of times uh, that walk away has inspired me to maybe like walk away into the desert and try to build stuff with other, other friends. But um, if you could frame yourself for us, please. Yeah, by all means. Um, I'm Corey Doctorow. Uh, I'm, a, as Jerry just mentioned, a science fiction writer. I've written a couple of dozen books, novels, nonfiction, books for small children and middle grades readers and young adults, as well as books for adults. I've worked with the Electronic Frontier Foundation for about 20 years now in various capacities, including in regulatory for I was our UN representative for many years at WIPO and, and at the ITU. Uh, I am a visiting professor of computer science at Open University in the UK, a visiting professor of library science at UNC and an MIT Media Lab research affiliate. Uh, and I'm one inch deep and 10 miles wide. <laughs> Love that. Um, and uh, Darius, um, your, your, your background is really interesting. Can you please uh, set it up for us? Oh, wonderful. Darius Quarles, co-founder and co-CEO at Bro Capital, calling in from Chicago. I am a Southside Chicago native. Um, I've been a technologist for the past 10 years. And with Bro Capital, we are changing the face of how Black men come together in community and help each other in advancing their financial wellness. So what we've done is we've created the first financial technology platform and community that's specifically dedicated to Black men. And I know that sounds fascinating because we launched this in 2016. And yes, we are the first to do what we do. So I'll be able to talk a little bit about sort of why that is and why that's actually problematic maybe a little bit today. Um, but what's fascinating about what we're leveraging is a cooperative model. So we are a cooperatively owned company. So I'm both sort of a co-founder of Bro Capital. I use the platform, I leverage the platform, I'm a member of the community, I'm a co-owner in the community, but I'm doing this alongside other black men all across the country and world who are making a commitment to advance their financial wellness by taking actions together. So every two weeks we are saving a small amount of money together, pooling that capital into an investment fund that we then cooperatively own and make decisions around in terms of reinvesting into ourselves and into our communities. Um, so I'm thankful to be here today and I'm, I'm sure I have a, a lot to share. Thank you for being, for being with us. Really appreciate that. Um, I'd like to start with two questions for all the panelists uh, and just one kind of, one kind of, uh, a little bit uh, on the dark side, one on the bright side. And the, the first one is like, what is the major obstacle that you faced uh, in your context to get to where you are right now? And I, I, for many of you, there are many different kinds of obstacles, but one that really stands out for you. And I'll, I'll mix up the, uh, the order uh, and maybe, uh, maybe if we could go uh, Katie, Darius, Matt, Corey. Well, so I think the greatest barrier to our work is that um, most folks that are designing platforms um, actually don't take kids very seriously. Um, and if you talk to young people, 70, more than like 80% of them do something.org did a recent survey that sort of asked kids about their, their tech use and their online lives. And um, almost 80% of them said that adults simply don't understand their lives online. 
Um, and I think that's been a big barrier for us because we're very much uh, work from a positive youth development perspective. We really believe young people are coming to us with expertise. They're not little, little people that have to be shaped by adult norms. They have their own needs, their own goals. Um, certainly in the gaming space, they are the experts. Um, often in the technology space, they are early adopters and they often break technology because they don't really care. They're just trying to figure out how to do what they want to do. So they're actually very um, kind of amazing innovators, but adults tend to not take them very seriously or just make have a little um, panel for them little uh, focus group, get some information, and then they go back and do the kind of adult-oriented stuff. So I think our biggest barrier has been trying to open up a space for young people's voices um, in the conversation around online communities, uh, particularly around inclusivity and diversity um, and safety, because safety for a young person may look really different than what safety for a parent looks like. Mm -hmm. And I'd love to unpack that a little bit, because we seem to have extended childhood a lot um, and a story I love to tell is uh, Admiral David Farragut was our first admiral early in the United States history. <clears throat> Can anybody tell me at what age he was put on board a warship as a midshipman? This was typical of the day. I used to say it was 12 years old, and then I fact-checked myself at nine. At nine years of age, he was put on board a warship as a midshipman, which was typical uh, and and <laughs> British Navy and, and U.S. Navy for a while, uh, the Navy was aristocratic, sort of on, uh, uh, inherited titles, inherited roles. And like we underestimate just how capable young people actually are. And I'm not saying that every nine year old ought to be put on a warship. That's probably not my advice. But I'm trying to say that young people are incredibly present, capable, like like we have managed to somehow dumb kids down which I think is part of the problem you're facing, Katie. I'm just wondering if you can reflect on that and if you could wave a magic wand and fix that. Like, what, what does that look like? <laughs> well, I think, I think part of it is historical and you're sort of pointing to this, um, in a way, the change in how children are raised and whose responsible it is to raise them. It used to be, right, even in the you know, 18th century, early 19th century, that communities raised children, right? And we thought about their learning um, they're learning their social emotional learning, their kind of academic learning, their kind of know how learning in the world happened in church. It happened in the in um, um, out on the playground. It happened in the homes. It was shared. But then what happened slowly over time is that school became the place where that was owned and then parents. So today we only think about schools and parents in a way as owning the raising of children. And of course, schools are structured in really particular ways. Kids are basically in a school for many, many years. Um, and for, for many reasons, parents have increasingly try, started sort of limiting, obviously, where kids can go and what they can do. And a lot, of the, a lot of the reasons are very authentic in terms of kind of worried about harms out, particularly in urban environments. Um, and that's translated to thinking about harms online. My parents are very nervous and very worried about sort of sending their kids out there. So if I were to raise a magic wand, it would be to kind of re-acknowledge that there are multiple stakeholders responsible for the kind of raising of young people. Um, and that when more people get involved, including young people, so someone earlier, several people earlier mentioned peer learning. It's so critical. And we know online that kids are learning socially. They're learning from each other. Um, and so if there was a way to kind of reopen that up, the kind of mindset that communities actually own their, their responsible stakeho stakeholders and sort of helping um, kids participate, that's, that would be my bond. Love that. Thank you, Katie. Um, Darius, um, obstacles on your way to getting where you are? Certainly the biggest obstacle I would say is definitively us as a platform owned and created for Black men having to sort of explain why this is an innovation in the first place, particularly this to majority white communities more often than not. It's something to where, of course, you, you, you have an inherent desire to want all people to sort of understand the model, but it, it so, so happens that when we start explaining why this is an innovation, it's not just sort of a, a lack of awareness that limits the ability of non-Black folk to understand what we're doing, but it's almost like sort of an inability to sort of step outside of your own background, your own experience, sort of just Eurocentric thought to where, you know, sort of to be taken along and really see and sort of understand why this is a business model innovation. So I, mm -hmm. I think that sort of lends itself to a conversation around who gets to call themselves an innovator, who gets to claim that, who gets to own that. 
um, more often than not, I think black innovators often find themselves sort of clawing and, and trying to get folks to see what, what they've actually created um, that is different from the traditional model. So in, in that regard, I would just want folks to understand that we're not slapping a black face on a white model, right? It's very different. We've decided to sort of build it from the ground up with a set of values that are in contrast to the traditional financial players of today um, and how they think about creating impact and how they think about what creating value for a community actually looks like. And the sort of the more you dig into it and if you sort of talk to some of our stakeholders, you'll see that, yeah, this is something different. Um, so that, that, would, that would be my commentary. Um, it, sort of, it sort of saddens me that this has to be as innovative as it is, that this isn't sort of commonplace and that we just, that, like this isn't just normal. Um, so it's, it's interesting that, that that's part of your, your, uh, your path, uh, but also you're drawing on an ancient tradition of saving circles. I mean, in Latin America, it's called a cesta. Uh, there's lots and lots of places where you put a nickel in every week uh, and then somebody like wins the lotto or it goes in a circle through the community and you keep going. But that takes me also to the question of saving circles are really cool because they don't require any external investment. They're, they're not looking for a big dose of credit to now lend out to everybody. It's like, like, like the difference between micro credit and micro savings programs. You know, micro savings programs are within the community. So, so how much acceptance or verification do you need or want from outside? And what role does that play in what you're doing? I think it's really, to a, to a large degree, it's about credibility. It's about validation. It's about trust. As soon as you have a conversation about money within any community, right, of, of, of all cultures and races, it's already sort of a, a conversation where most people are going to be on edge about it, right? Um, so I think if you add on top of that sort of the skepticism that comes from just being a Black innovator within that space, right, it, it, it can really, it can, it can make it difficult, right, to just have that validation within the community. So I I think having more accept acceptance sort of within mainstream circles, that would ease the conversation. That would, that would sort of show people that, um, yeah, you know, you can trust us, right? We've been, we've been verified by these outside sources and folks are recognizing this as an innovation and recognizing this as something that's needed within the community. So I think those are a few of the things that come to mind. Thank you. Thank you. So much of what we're all talking about here revolves around trust in really interesting ways. Um, so uh, Matt, same, same question, largest sort of obstacle on your way to where you are sort of organizationally or personally. Well, it, it, there, there's, there are some interesting parallels, uh, not, not, uh, not perfect, but, uh, but close. Uh, you know, we, we're committed to trying to build digital economy jobs in, in rural places. Uh, and, you know, many people say, well, you know, is the concern that there isn't enough talent? Are there not enough universities? Or is there not enough, you know, venture capital that's out there? And, and those are all, you know, challenges and issues. And by the way, I tried to up the game on the background. So I hope it's rocking. I like it. Yeah, thank you. Um, Corey just, you know, set a really high bar there. So um, anyway, uh, but what's interesting is that the biggest barrier, which I had not thought would be a thing, uh, was, was on narrative shift, uh, was that people struggle to believe that you can actually do technology in rural places. Full stop. Which, which just strikes me as the oddest thing in the world. I mean, I grew up, uh, you know, actually I'm on the farm that you see in the picture back here uh, in rural Vermont. Um, you know, I, my first job in technology was at 25 running marketing for a software company that was solving uh, the problems of, of information for commercial printers all over the world. And, and I didn't think that was strange, right? Of course you could do that and live wherever you wanted to, as long as you had a strong broadband connection uh, and you were able to, uh, you know, unlock the innovation to be able to solve a, a market problem. But as we've been doing this work, uh, that barrier for people to think that you can actually do uh, tech in rural, like somehow if you grew up in rural or you're living in rural, you can't code or you can't come up with an idea that solves a problem, uh, it, it comes up over and over again. And it's from folks who are sometimes in the you know, technology uh, world them themselves. Sometimes it's from folks in rural places. 
that have had that repeated over and over again, because you've got to have an agglomeration of at least a million people of these kinds of talents in order to do it, um, even though it, it doesn't actually get reflected in the kinds of technology companies that are emerging uh, across, across rural places. Uh, the pandemic has actually done a little bit to change that, which is an interesting outcome as people have discovered, oh, I can go and live in a place that I would rather live and still continue to do uh, work. Um, we're not necessarily advocates of completely uh, remote work because we think that community and synergy is super important, um, but it doesn't have to be uh, limited to 35 zip codes in the entire United States. It act, those kinds of pods for innovation, for creating uh, you know, companies and innovation and contributing to larger companies or to building your own small one can actually happen anywhere. So we've been spending a, a disproportionate amount of time uh, not working with communities to stand up uh, innovation hubs and accelerator, you know, tech accelerator programs, or you know, launching our seed fund that's now seen over a, a hundred scalable tech companies in deal flow across the twenty communities that we uh, work with. Um, it's been on working with with people who are are, are getting it, like you know, Tom Friedman uh, in the New York Times and uh, and uh, uh, others uh, at Wired who are saying, oh, right, this can happen uh, and this is possible. And in fact, if we're going to get to economic equity uh, in our country, we have to, uh, based on geography, we have to focus on it. And then the final piece is uh, the fact that, uh, you know, we, we, we do try to remind folks that uh, rural America is not white America at all. And if we are going to be committed to uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion as a nation, we cannot leave out uh, black and brown rural folks who have so much to offer, um, but are facing uh, the most intense uh, challenges of economic advancement uh, and, and mobility. Um, so those, those narrative shifts are, are ones that we're, we're out there uh, working on every day. We've actually had the good fortune of getting resources to do uh, small, uh, short videos uh, that just highlight uh, these places. Um, many times folks say, can you just show me what a rural place that does technology is? And, and so we're, we're doing that. Uh, and um, it's been uh, fulfilling, but just an interesting, uh, uh, an, an interesting piece to the, the puzzle. Uh, and and to, your, uh, to your point, uh, Jim Fallows has certainly been uh, about that. Uh, we, he also likes excuses to fly in his plane and exactly. go have really good beer, but uh, he and I have had a, a couple conversations about the importance of getting this uh, narrative shift out there. Exactly. It seems like one of the strongest forces in modern American politics is uh, maybe the rural urban divide and the idea that policies basically left uh, the center of the country behind, that, that rural areas feel left behind. And I may, be, I may be stereotyping, I'm sort of picking up on lots and lots and lots of things I've read and so forth. Does that show up in your work? And if so, in what way? Absolutely. And, and you see it in a variety of different forms. I mean, we've, we've, we frankly, we've seen it, uh, and it's come about because of a few different things. You know, as those e economies started to deviate, uh, you also see it, saw a disruption in media. And so rural places literally lost their voice through newspapers or local television networks. They're gone. So they're, they're dependent on uh, urban-centric uh, media. Uh, and and it's always the outlier or there's something bad that happens in rural places and then suddenly it gets picked up on. Uh, the, you know, you, you've also seen it through, uh, through politics, right? I mean, it doesn't take, uh, you know, a, a PhD in political science to know uh, that when there is deep frustration uh, about your agency, about your ability to, uh, you know, forge a life for yourself or your family, when you see, um, you know, net population loss. The, the first net population loss in rural America was in, in the last 70 years was not during the farm crisis. It was 2011, 12, and 13 that also coincided with an, uh, an opioid epidemic uh, that, that killed so many people 
quietly across rural America and a suicide rate um, that is skyrocketing, particularly among uh, farmers. And, and so you've, you've got this underreported uh, crisis um, economically that's happening. Uh, and, and the folks who are, who are leaving rural America are, are younger people who have gotten college educated, who've taken advantage of the strong schools in these small communities uh, that believe in empowering young people at nine on a combine or uh, in, in getting to school yeah. on their own, but that they um, they get to, to get to college and they are told, you have potential, you've got to get away. And that's the, uh, the thing that we're pushing against, that in fact, these beautiful downtowns in rural places can be centers of innovation and can be places where people pursue uh, aspirational uh, careers. Um, just a small side note for, as sort of milestones in history. Um, around the era of the Civil War, about 80% of Americans were engaged in food production, 80%. By World War I, that number was down to 20%. Everybody went off the farm into factories, into towns, into cities to start doing white collar work, other sorts of things. Today, that number is 1.5%. So 1.5% of Americans make the food that feeds us and we export all over the place. So it's like, like rural areas have been through all kinds of change like that. Um, Corey, same question. Obstacles. You're muted locally. Sorry, hit the wrong button there. Yep. I, I, I mean, I guess I'm going to speak to you with my activist rather than my writer hat on, although I could Sounds talk great. about that too. Um, you know, the first decade or and a half or so of my life working on internet issues was about trying to prevent the internet from shrinking into five giant websites filled with screenshots of text from the other four. And we failed. Uh, and we failed basically because of an orthodoxy that was born at the same time as tech. In 1979, the Apple II Plus hit the shelves and Ronald Reagan hit the campaign trail. And one of his signature uh, uh, regulatory uh, initiatives was to stop enforcing antitrust law as we knew it and to exercise enormous tolerance for predatory mergers and acquisitions and predatory conduct. And so we have seen the growth of firms that exist entirely in the realm of Moneyball, right? Where you have companies like Google that have made one and a half successful products. They made a, a great search engine and a Hotmail clone and everything else they've done that's successful, they bought from someone else and everything that they tried to do internally failed, whether that's Wi-Fi balloons or RSS readers. And uh, that kind of growth has turned the internet into a place that is... Um, endangered in many ways. It gathers a lot of power into a small number of hands. So we have moderation choices about all kinds of things, apps and speech and um, uh, algorithmic ranking and so on that are being made ultimately by a handful of people. You know, we look at that photo of the tech leaders around the table at the top of Trump Tower in 2017, and many people were aghast that these bastions of enlightenment thought were sitting down with Donald Trump. But, you know, equally, if not more concerning, is that they all fit around one table. Uh, to today, uh, the thing that stands in my way is the way that we conceive of these uh, monopolistic firms, and in particular, which economic uh, concepts we bring to bear on them. So primarily when we talk about large firms and their economic dominance, we uh, talk about their network effects. It's when a service gets better, the more people use it. Um, you know, if, if uh, you have a service where you have a, a sharing economy car rental, then the more cars there are, the more people who will join. And the more people who join, the more demand there is for cars and the more cars people will have and so on. Um, in the case of, say, Facebook, uh, you will join Facebook because of the people who are there you want to talk to. Other people will join Facebook once you're there because they want to talk to you. And it's true that firms get very big because of network effects. But taken on its own, a doctrine of network effects is a, a doctrine of despair because it says it's a winner take all economy. Once they get big, they'll never get small again. And, you know, that doesn't explain how we saw the rise and fall of Cray or Silicon Graphics, why we're not all using Alta Vista. Uh, network effects aren't the whole story. The other part of the story is switching costs, what you have to give up to leave. And to leave Facebook is to leave behind the family, the friends, the community, and the customers that you rely on there. And that's not because it's inconceivable that you could leave Facebook and stay in touch with your friends. If you quit Verizon and join T-Mobile, you don't lose touch with your friends. They don't even know you quit. You keep your phone number. 
Facebook and the other big tech companies, Apple, Google, Microsoft, LinkedIn, which is also Microsoft because the web is five giant companies full of screenshots of text from the other four and so on. They all have done everything in their power to punish you as much as possible for leaving. And the worse uh, uh, you suffer when you leave their firm, the more they can mistreat you without risking you leaving. And lowering those switching costs is a matter of increasing interoperability. Uh, I'm very excited to see Congress discussing interoperability legislatively through the Access Act, the European Union doing the same thing through the Digital Markets and Digital Services Acts. Uh, but you know, once upon a time, we didn't need legislative action to make interop happen. We had a generalized freedom to plug new things into existing things. You could uh, invent Facebook, as Mark Zuckerberg did, and you could confront the the reality that everyone who wanted to use social media already had a MySpace account, as Mark Zuckerberg did. And then as Mark Zuckerberg did, you could just make a bot that people who quit MySpace could use to log into MySpace on their behalf, get their waiting messages and put them in your Facebook inbox. When firms have done that to Facebook, they've sued them into radioactive craters. That kind of adversarial interoperability, competitive compatibility, the kind of thing that allowed Apple to defeat Microsoft by cloning all of its Office file formats and making the iWork suite is today completely off limits. No one can do under, unto the tech giants as the tech giants did unto everyone else. And the fact that we have just lost our ability to conceive of a pluralistic internet, an internet where decision-making is spread out, where it, we don't try to find a way to make Zuckerberg a better ruler of 3 billion people's lives, but instead abolish the job of being in charge of 3 billion people's lives. That I think is a, is a huge crisis as we start to think about switching costs instead of network effects, or in addition to network effects, I think we have the opportunity to do something about it. And um, there's many places I could go with everything you just said, but one small thing that rises is that Ben Franklin, one of our founding fathers, made a living by pirating uh, works outside of copyright. And so did lots of people in the United States. We were, we were born and financed uh, in some way by kind of uh, breaking rules that we uh, then real, really have doubled down and reinforced. Same thing with Walt Disney. Walt Disney basically does, and you, you, go, you, you and Disney go way back when, um, but you know, he rips off, uh, Steamboat Willie to create Mickey Mouse. And then the first, uh, the first and most successful minstrel cartoon character. Exactly. Exactly. From minstrelsy. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and, and so there's, there's lots and lots of stories to tell behind this. So, so thank you for, for shining a bright light on that as, as an obstacle. Thank you. Uh, so just so we don't need therapists after the session, I want to turn around and ask the optimistic question. And this is, what is the brightest beacon on your horizon of all the things that you're working on? What is the thing that has you excited that you think is like, this could be a breakthrough or this might work, or if only we do this a lot, this is going to go. And let's change the order to um, Darius, Matt, Corey, and Katie. Without a doubt, it is the the optimism that I have in the folks who are using the, the Bro Capital platform, it, it's, it's the people um, and sort of the different relationships that I've been able to form with them from the, the co-owners, my fellow co-owners within Bro Capital to the members in general. It's sort of the, the faith that they have in themselves that they can create the change that they want to see. And we're not waiting on venture capital to do it. We're not waiting from an investment from the traditional bank players in order to do it. Um, we're going to leverage this cooperatively owned, community owned model um, to get our point across and hopefully catch the attention of all those players at a later date. Um, so it's, it's really just that empowerment um, from within that sort of is, is exciting me and providing me the faith to continue doing this work. Um, so, yeah. That is great. Thank you, Darius. Uh, Matt? So I'm going to say there's a couple of things giving me optimism. Uh, one is uh, coming out of the pandemic, there was a realization that uh, broadband uh, is not a nice to have, it's a necessity. Um, and that's been one of the biggest barriers in, in rural places to be able to participate in, in modern economies. Uh, Jerry, you mentioned the shift from agriculture to manufacturing, where rural places actually got left out of the manufacturing movement until we did electrification. Right when we did rural electrification, suddenly there was you know a lot more equity in uh, in across uh, geographies uh, in being able to participate in in that revolution. 
broadband is the equivalent. And what I feel optimistic about is there is real momentum. There's already been in, in the ARPA funding and in the infrastructure bill to actually do this once and for all and make sure that there is access uh, to hopefully, Corey will succeed in making it fully democratized uh, kind of a, a system um, to be at least able to participate in education in employment uh, and in uh, uh, healthcare and 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 in entrepreneurship, uh, and and there's also a, a growing uh, sentiment that that needs that that access. You need the infrastructure at a basic level, um, but you also need access financially. And we cannot have haves and haves not on uh, access to the information superhighway. So that gives me optimism. But I'm I'm, I'm going to uh, say basically the same thing that that uh, Darius said, which is that the people who are involved in the rural innovation network. Uh, just get me inspired each and every day when I have someone who comes and say, well, can rural people really code? I, I go back and I see these people who are just crushing it and they're crushing it against the odds. They've got their, you know, the, the folks who are on the city council in their hometown who are thinking they're crazy, uh, but they're pushing forward and creating incredibly inclusive uh, innovation hubs in beautiful spaces that you would want uh, anyone to be able to to, to uh, be able to participate in in co-work areas which are collaborative by nature and their synergy and and they're creating amazing products and uh, and they're supporting uh, community uh, at the same time both within uh, their small uh, their small community um, but also uh, in this larger network that we've created uh, where people do not see it as competitive, uh, so much in economic development is about, you know, the race to the bottom of who can give enough tax credits to get a parts manufacturer for one auto company to locate in their industrial park. And so they, they come at it, uh, it, it um, at, uh, adversarially, uh, whereas when you're building uh, innovation uh, uh, hubs in these rural places, they see it as completely collaborative and, uh, and it's just inspiring to see. I love that. That sounds great. A uh, small historical thing. Uh, rural telephony took off faster than in cities because of a different invention, uh, barbed wire. They used the barbed wire and connected it from property to property. So you get a party line way out to the last ranch uh, that used barbed wire as the conductor cable for, for phone calls. But then, of course, all your neighbors could listen in. But, but, but telephony was really important to people out in rural areas. Um, Corey, then Katie. Thanks. You know, uh, my my colleague, uh, the great James Boyle at Duke University, talks a lot about how uh, the word ecology changed the game for the environmental movement. That before we had a word that encompassed a bunch of issues, it wasn't immediately obvious why your concern about owls related to my concern about the ozone layer. What what does a charismatic nocturnal avian have to do with the gaseous composition of the upper atmosphere, right? But once we started talking about ecology, all of a sudden that all snapped together. And I feel like there are a lot of people who are rightfully upset about monopolies in tech and, and the way that those bring harm to them, but they're only one kind of monopoly. Um, all the Halloween candy for sale in your candy aisle comes from like three companies. And there's only one pro wrestling league. And there's also only one company that makes glasses. They also make all the lenses and own every glasses store you've ever heard of. Every brand all owned by this one French Italian consortium called Luxottica. Uh, there's only like four banks and there's only three record labels and there's one movie studio and there's four talent agencies in Hollywood. Uh, there's uh, only a couple of fast food chains and, you know, we are slowly but surely coming together around this idea that the problem isn't that Vince McMahon bought all the other wrestling leagues and like reclassified his employees as contractors and took away their health care so that they're begging for pennies on GoFundMe to die with dignity in their 50s of their workplace related injuries. The problem is monopoly. That is the expression of the problem. But the problem is monopoly. And if we can build a coalition that crosses all of these boundaries, if the people are angry about Halloween candy, can join forces with the people who are angry about the fact that there's only two brewers left and only four giant banks and also only one company making cheerleader uniforms, then we can build a coalition that's unstoppable, a coalition that made the New Deal possible, uh, a coalition that could really restructure our civilization for human thriving, which, you know, we've only got so much time to do. Um, 
we're not on fire yet here in Southern California, but literally like the people who clean our solar panels pinged me yesterday and said, are, are you going to have us around to clean them off? And I said, oh, no, not until after the wildfires. And they said, oh, yeah, that's smart because we know they're coming and we know they'll be worse than last year's. So is um, the question was, what's the brightest light? Is Lena Khan at the FTC the oh, bright yeah. light here? So like, I don't want to be a cult of personality person here, you know, like Lena Khan is amazing. She is absolutely amazing. She is the right person for that job. And there's, you know, whispers that Gigi Sohn might end up running the FCC, which would be like a Lena Khan moment for the FCC and really astoundingly great. But, you know, Lena Khan on her own can't get anything done. Lena Khan needs a big popular groundswell behind her, which she's getting. Right. So it's not just Lena Khan. It's the the forces that conspired to make Lena Khan possible in the chair seat at the FTC, which is this popular groundswell that is brewing. And also the synergy between Lena Khan and this groundswell that once she's there, she can govern with political will behind her with a tailwind because we're all there. Uh, fighting our corners for it. Some of us care about owls and other people care about the ozone layer, but we all understand that we're fighting for ecology. Thank you. Um, Katie, brightest, brightest beacon on your horizon, yeah. given, the issue, so, given, given the issues you care about. Well, so we're, weirdly, the pandemic has been in a way, a kind of bright beacon around changes in mental models, particularly around young people's um, lives online. So what the pandemic did is it obviously it drove kids online in, in, you know, historically unprecedented numbers, particularly in gaming. And also for many young people, they were in the house with their parents sitting next to their parents who now had insight into the lives of these kids, their online lives. Um, and one, so we saw, we've seen a big shift in a mental model, which I've heard this, several folks have talked about like these kind of resistant models. So there's been a very resistant model around gaming and kids, lots of adults, lots of parents, very nervous, popular narrative around gaming causes addiction, gaming causes kids to be violent, right? Which all the research doesn't, doesn't support that. So suddenly parents are seeing what actually their kids are doing and they're, they're kind of blown away, super impressed. The pandemic also shone a light on the kids whose parents were not in the home. Latino parents were the most likely to be out of the home during the pandemic as essential workers. A sudden gap, it wasn't about access in terms of these kids did have the internet, but they didn't have any kind of structure or kind of guidance um, that might've happened in the home. Um, you know, if a parent or other kind of uh, caring had, had been there. So that's one thing is we've seen a shift. We, see, we feel like, oh my gosh, the game people, that we have an opening to change the conversation in a research-based way. The second is there's suddenly now a really nice intersection between the good internet people, people that are aspiring to, you know, make them, the internet kind of better overall and issues of health and wellness, right? Which also was, was amplified by the pandemic. Um, and so suddenly the conversation, the mental health folks are talking to the good internet folks. And this, com this conversation around online community is being situated partially in the context of health and wellness, which I think is really amazing. Prior, they've been very separate. Um, and so there's this conception that one can find a space of refuge online with others. What does that look like? Well, it looks really different depending who you are, how old you are, and what community you come from. So there's, again, a kind of a new recognition that we, it's just like, again, a kind of model, a way of thinking about an online community as a space of health and wellness. So, so that for me is really exciting. Mm, thank you. Um, Michelle, um, you had mentioned that um, you talked some about sort of employment benefits of Turo and all that. And we're, we're at this really interesting strange, broken equilibrium moment, you know, punctuated equilibrium in things like the future of work. Um, how is Chiro kind of addressing that so that it can become part of a, like a stable platform for people uh, as, we, as we move forward? Um, well, you know, a lot, of, a lot of the developments and enhancements we've seen in the platform have developed organically. So when people first came on Turo, it's like, oh, I've got a car in my driveway, my kids away at college. They only need it in the summer and the winter. I'm paying for insurance and it's, you know, the battery keeps dying because I'm not driving it enough. And so I'll put it on the platform and sharing and share it. And then they realized, oh, gosh, I covered the cost of that car and actually a little bit of then some. Maybe I'll, I'll, you know, I'll get 
a, a newer car or a better car or a different car or a use case um, that I hadn't anticipated. And I'm covering the cost of that car. And while our idea is to put the world's 1 billion cars to better use, so certainly we're not interested in more manufacturing more and more and more cars, but many people can then not necessarily need to own a car. You know, maybe maybe some families had two cars because they needed a car to, to tow a boat for a summer vacation or an RV or something like that. Well, now they sort of have the freedom because their neighbor, someone a few blocks away or a few miles away has that car that they need for a limited period of time. And so our vision and our hope and our goal is that certainly far less cars are manufactured and produced. Um, you know, the rental car industry um, buys and and it replaces their fleet every two to three years. It's just a tremendous amount of waste. And so our vision is really that fewer cars can be manufactured, fewer cars are needed. And those cars that are manufactured are utilized more, um, but, but fewer cars need to be owned. And so, you know, our model um, as some of the other speakers said, you know, uh, I think the speaker that that um, was speaking about the the domestic work, you know, you you decide how many cars you own that you want to own. You decide how many days you want to share them. You decide how much you want to price them. You become entrepreneurial. Um, and you have access to an entrepreneurial enterprise that you may not have otherwise had the access to. As I mentioned, you know, we are disproportionate, our hosts are disproportionately from um, the immigrant communities, from minority communities. This is an alternative. It's an empowering alternative. And so, um, you know, for most people, is it going to replace a full-time job? No. I mean, you would really have to put a lot into it, but we have hosts. We have hosts who now own 20 or 30 cars. We have hosts in Hawaii who are telling all of their neighbors, here, give me your car. We have all these tourists coming to Hawaii. There's not enough rental cars. You have people buying, you know, renting U-Hauls, literally going on vacation to, you know, Kauai and renting a U-Haul because there are no rental cars. Now, my mom's never going to share her car, but I can share her car for her. You know what I mean? And, and, and share that, share that money with, with, with her. Um, and so you have a lot of entrepreneurial people who say, Hey, I've got time and expertise. Let me share your car for you. And I'll share, you know, what, and we'll, we'll both benefit from the proceeds. So I think there's for entrepreneurial folks, there are opportunities and we do have families where now, you know, they have left their full-time job and they are doing this full-time. Um, and, that, and then for other people, it's just a way for them to help pay for college or law school or grad school mm -hmm. or, you know, getting their LSW. And so, um, you know, it is very flexible. And um, the great thing about it from our perspective is unlike uh, Uber or DoorDash or Lyft, you're not having to sit in your car 40 to 60 hours a day and try to find a place to go to the bathroom. You know, this is something you have a, a resource, you can share it, but the rest of the time that your car is being shared, someone has my car right now for two weeks. I it took me 10 minutes to meet them at the beginning. It'll take me five minutes to meet them at the end. But for the next two weeks, the car that I'm not using is actually on its way up to Seattle because a guy wants to take a road trip up and up the coast. And so um, it really is, you know, providing economic opportunity without having to tether you um, to your vehicle. You can go about living your life, raising your kids, going to school or working your full-time job. Um, and it provides that, that little boost and that, that opportunity for economic empowerment. And we're, we've recently launched a program because of the disproportionate um, limited access to to capital that Darius actually talked about the Turo Seed Host Initiative. We're giving a million dollar uh, in loans to traditionally underrepresented folks, underrepresented in entrepreneurial communities, so that they can buy a car and share it and and seek economic empowerment. And and that program we've started that out through Kiva, um, which I think is great and very much in line with what many of your speakers um, have talked about. Um, but providing capital access, micro loans to folks. Uh, to make a better life for themselves. Um, so these are, you know, just some of the things that we're excited about um, at Turo. 
Thank you, Michelle. Uh, we only we have a little less than 10 minutes left. And uh, this, this panel topic was building better online markets and communities. And I wanted to ask an open question to whoever would like to jump in and answer it uh, from the lightning speakers or the panelists. And that is um, markets and communities. Uh, it seems like we, we've talked about co-ops a whole bunch and co-ops to me blend markets and communities because co-ops only work when they are effective communities. They require uh, people to be in relationship to, to function well. Um, and I, I wonder if you just sort of riff on that. How, how are these structures changing the nature of what you do? Um, what are the trickling sort of uh, effects into your own communities and how that works? Uh, any, any, any of those kinds of themes, just this, this intersection, because very often markets sort of kill off communities or they think they can own communities. And that's really not so, doesn't, doesn't end so well. But, but this, this fruitful intersection of markets and communities, how's that playing out for you? And raise your hand in the, in the thing or just make a signal. I've got like auctioneer's eyes if you want to um, comment on that. Uh, Sylvia, please. Thanks. Yeah, I think this is a really important question because, you know, especially in what some people are calling like the platform cooperativism movement, I think there's this question about how governance can work, um, especially with really large platforms to reach the scale where they can be competitive with some of the more traditional um, and frankly, exploitative tech platforms. Um, and I think, you know, for us, because we're a community-based organization that had always been doing worker organizing and building those relationships first, we built on that with starting with what we knew worked and figuring out what technology was needed and where there are things we need to do as human beings together. Um, so, up and Go is actually structured as a cooperative of co-ops. So there are multiple worker-owned cleaning businesses who market their services jointly through Up and Go. Um, so it functions a bit like a federation. Um, so there's a board that's elected by the membership and we the membership functions mostly through what we call membership committee. It's basically the management body that meets regularly with appointed representatives from each worker cooperative that's part of the platform. Um, and you know, a lot of the work we've been doing over these five years is figuring out what decisions need to be made at what level. What can the membership body feel empowered to make through their own, you know, in-depth discussions about really complicated issues? Like if we're talking about standard pricing, or if we're thinking about um, policies related to, yeah, how to handle cancellations or complaints. There are some things I think, especially over time with building leadership that people have felt more comfortable to make without bringing back to the full membership of their cooperatives. Um, and over time, you know, questions that people are also able to resolve, uh, not necessarily through a full meeting, right? And where we are able to maybe use technology to facilitate certain decisions more. Um, we also are, this is maybe a slightly different version of what you're talking about, but as I mentioned, you know, the, the group we're working with, it's not like they were working on Handy and now they're just getting paid better on Up and Go, right? These people who are excluded from other platforms. Um, and so a lot of what we're doing is also thinking about, you know, where is technology needed most? Okay, it's mostly the consumer facing tools um, because we're trying to reach people who want to book their services online. Um, for worker owners, we didn't actually build out an app interface that they have to learn to navigate in order to get jobs and compete. We spoke with them about what kinds of systems they have in their cooperatives for assigning jobs and didn't try to recreate the wheel or invent new policies that could potentially be discriminatory. So I think um, I might have gone a bit off course of the initial question, but I think rather than sort of seeing the cooperative structure figuring out how to meet that with the tech world. It's more about, well, we're thinking about how to approach doing business in this market that people are navigating as a cooperative um, and leveraging that to come up with better systems and better tools. So that's a bit of my answer. I love that. Thanks, Sylvia. That, that's great. Uh, and I'm reminded, I mean, being in a cooperative and being in community is a time sink. It like requires an investment of your hours of being present for the people. And I'm reminded of Oscar Wilde's uh, old quote, the trouble with socialism is that it takes too many evenings. Um, anybody else Barry, about- Barry, uh, I'll, to, I'll please, just Matt, fly, I mean, you know, w w you know, someone uh, asked us at one point what it is that we do. And, and I said, we're, we're an ecosystem of ecosystem builders. 
right? I mean, and that's, it, and, it, and it's interesting. It does take a lot of time, right, to do it right. But it's it's super powerful uh, because, and especially as we're trying to make a shift in uh, narrative, in economics, and where these things uh, can happen, to be able to have, uh, you know, network value uh, emerge across these different uh, locations. On, on a, and it's not a formal cooperative in the ways that some of these other organizations are doing. It's more of a membership uh, model, um, but it's having a similar kind of impact where you're creating uh, a collective that's engaging a market uh, to be able to make sure there's more equitable uh, participation. And I, I'm, I'm, we're excited about that. The other thing I'll just quickly flag is that um, uh, a couple of uh, successful tech founders uh, came to us and said, you know, we're, we're excited about what you're doing. Uh, and we think that um, rural innovators would be perfect for the next generation of open source uh, technology innovation, uh, you know, real open source. Uh, and, and it was an interesting discussion because they said, look, you, you, need as, you need very little infrastructure you need now, you need very little uh, startup capital, uh, and you need to have a sense of collaboration and community, which rural folks just sort of have to have because... You, you can't specialize, right? Because there's not, you need to wear many, many hats. Uh, and so we're now uh, in the process of putting together uh, a, a, a concept for a, a open source incubator that would start in one of our communities, but eventually go to the uh, entire community and um, with, a, with a, a fund that would go along with it and the like. So uh, it's just, it's, it's a really interesting iteration on that same theme. Uh, in our space that has emerged as we've been getting out the word. Um, and if folks are interested, please uh, let us know. That sounds really wonderful. I'd like to know more. Um, so I'll be in touch. Um, it's really interesting because I'm a fan of regenerative agriculture and there's a bunch of other sort of names for it, permaculture, organic, and what, there's many sort of variants. But one thing I realized in visiting a farm in uh, above Sebastopol in California was when you go uh, when you go regenerative, you make enemies of the John Deere salesperson in town, the fertilizer salesperson, the Monsanto rep, like, like all the wealthy people in town are suddenly like your enemies. And you need so much about change for me is social. We need, we need like somebody with us who's on the journey together, who we can link arms with and who will back us and have our backs. And Darius, you're building this for communities of black men. And, and I, I just think I just think we underappreciate, like we underappreciate the intelligence of young humans. Uh, we underappreciate the, the, the importance of this community set of bonds. Uh, and Darius, if you want to take us out, we only have a, a minute or so left. But if you just want to want to reflect on that, that would uh, be a great, great way to wrap our, our panel. Certainly. Two points I would make in, in terms of sort of the, the opportunity that cooperative models present. I think sort of two things there, it's really providing the opportunity for ownership. That's not saying that everybody wants to be a co-owner in the company that they work for. That's something that we found or they don't necessarily wanna be a co-owner in the platform necessarily that they're leveraging, but many folks do, right? So just having the opportunity for them to get involved in that way um, creates a, a, an entirely different dynamic. Um, and then secondly, sort of, just the, the opportunity for equitable financial benefits. When, when these platforms do become successful, it becomes a question of who benefits from that, right? Both in the short term and in the long term. So I, I think cooperative models in that way also present an opportunity to at least address some of the issues that we're um, seeing today. And then to your, to your other point, um, to, to close out in terms of just community, yes, you certainly need that because these untraditional models are definitely gonna, you, you're gonna come into conflict with um, traditional players, no, no, no doubt about it. We're, we're certainly seeing it um, in our model. And in some ways that, that's not necessarily like direct competition or folks trying to undercut you. And in, in, in certain ways, it's just sort of a dismissiveness, right? As Matt spoke to, that in and of itself can, can be enough to, to really sort of, you know, um, stifle, stifle growth and stifle your opportunity. So um, that's something I'll, I'll comment on. Thank you for that, Darius. Um, with that, I want to thank our lightning speakers, our panelists. Uh, this has been really fun and interesting and hopefully useful to everybody listening in. And I'll pass control back to the man behind the curtain, uh, Dustin.